I've got my drink. <sighs> Let's just say that's the best drink ever. Cinetonic! Hi guys. Welcome back to Sin and Tonic. I am so glad to be here this week. So, so sorry that I missed an upload last week. I had a small human, one of my small humans, um, home from school. And these are not the sort of stories that you want little ears listening in on. No way. And you need peace and quiet to enjoy Jim. Which, by the way, oh, hold me now. Welcome to another episode of Sin and Tonic. <laughs> this week's story is that of Jane Topan. Jane Topan. Also known as Jolly Jane. There is not much jolly about this story though. Let's start at the very beginning. Very good place to start. What shall I call her for the purposes of this video? Jane. Jane Topan was born in 19... 1854 and very sadly her mother passed away um, when Jane was in her infancy so she was a baby that's what infancy means it was said that it wasn't a very pleasant childhood her mother had obviously passed away and her father was an alcoholic and generally crazy he was known as a crackpot so Jane's father after the death of her mother, he went into this decline, into alcoholism and madness. When Jane was quite young, her and her youngest sister were then sent to an orphanage. So the only thing that was written about this was that the girls had been taken from, taken from a miserable family life. So it sounds like they were better off away from their father. So this happened when Jane was quite small. Something to know. She was called Nora before and then she was given the name Jane when she was adopted. So from this orphanage she was adopted by the Topans. They gave her their last name and they called her Jane. So that's where she got her name Jane. Mm, that gin is so nice. Sorry, so distracted. Also the first gin in over a week. Can you believe? So what was I saying? Bum, 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 bum. Jane did very, very well. She excelled in school and there was no bumps in the road thereafter until later on, which we will get to. In the 1880s, Jane signed on as a student nurse. And again, she excelled in all of her classwork and things like that. Really clever girl. However, this is where things started to come to light if you like. So her tutors were a bit disturbed by the way she was with the autopsies. So she behaved in a very strange manner around dead people. And her, her tutors were like, uh, okay. This was in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And yeah, so they were a bit worried because she was obsessed this was what the case, this is what was wrong. She was obsessed with the autopsies. And then two patients mysteriously died when within her, in her care. And this hospital was like, mm, bye, see ya. This meant that she had no qualification and she then had to forge the paperwork for her to be classed as a nurse. <sighs> So she's forged her paperwork. She's been kicked out of nursing school because they're like, you're a weirdo. And these people have died in her care. They're not having any of this noise. So she's kicked out. She's forged her paperwork. Like I said, it doesn't seem to be going too great for Jane. And then turns itself completely around. Sounds like Jane's very charming. She was called Jolly Jane. That was the, um, she was like very uh, likeable and friendly and caring and kind. And this was the reputation that she had for herself. Jolly old Jane. So she has forged all this paperwork and then she took 
lots and lots of families on over the years in New England where she was their like private nurse. So this seems to be quite a common thing. So she was like the nurse of that family. Well, you don't want to be one of those families, basically. One of these families was called the Davis family. So Jolly Jane was their, their nurse. So they took her on and she was going to be their nurse. Matty Davis was one of um, Jane's old friends. So it makes sense that she sort of like got her in to be her nurse. Oh, you're, oh, you're a nurse, yeah. Old friends, yeah. That's how that went down. And then really sadly, on the 4th of July, 1901, Matty passed away. So she was under the care of Jane. And Jane went with the body back. I'm going to get a parcel, I think. So you might have to excuse me in a moment. It's Christmas coming soon. Alan Davis kept Jane on as the family nurse. So there was nothing like suspicious at this point. And then on the 29th of July, so really not long after, their daughter, Annie, passed away. And even worse, well, that's not even worse, but worse yet, worse still, worse more. And then... Alan himself, so Mr. Davis himself, a few days later after Annie. So the Matty has passed away under Jane's care and then less than a month later her daughter Annie and then we move on to Alan and he's died too. And this was blamed on a huge stroke. Delivery, special delivery service. Excuse me, where was I? It was a parcel. Oh yeah. The surviving daughter, Mary Gibbs. Excuse you. I'm gonna have to shoot the dog. <laughs> the dog is fine. The surviving daughter, Mary Gibbs, she's married. She is then pronounced dead on the 29th of August. So that's like the whole family gone. <sighs> now, Mary Gibbs, her husband, he's like, no, what? He demanded an autopsy. He was like, what, what's going on? Jane really was like, no, 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 no. She tried to like say that it was ridiculous and that there was no need for an autopsy and it was all natural causes and bloody blue. Then off she trots, she disappears, so she's off skis. In the autopsy, it's found that there was a massive overdose of morphine and that this is how Mary had died. My eyeball is falling out of its socket, why? Subsequent autopsies on the previous members of the family also showed that they had died from a lethal dose of morphine. Jane, what are you doing? Jane wasn't done there, no, so she's she's disappeared. She then goes to Amherst, New Hampshire, and she bumps off her foster sister. She bumps her off. Worse yet, she then tries, I don't know why I keep saying worse yet, because all of it's worse. It's all bad, Sophie. I don't know where I've picked that up from. Have I read it somewhere recently? Shush. Anyhow, next, she then poisons herself and poisons the husband of her foster sister. Right, are we keeping up? Because I'm not sure if I'm being clear. So she kills her foster sister. See you later. And then she moves in for her foster sister's husband. She's like sweeping in for that naughty Jane. So she thinks, mm, so she poisons him to, just to make him sick. Then she's like jolly Jane, the nurse, like nurses him to health again. And then that's obviously not like doing it for him. So she then poisons herself to make herself really poorly so that he's like, oh, I feel so sorry for you. But that doesn't work either. And he's just like, go away. No. So, you know, that didn't work out. So she didn't get the husband of her foster sister, thank God. Um, she probably would have killed him anyway. She's a terrible person. So that's that. So she doesn't get with the husband. I was like, oh, yeah. After this, the police find her and they arrest her. 
and she was currently working with other patients so they they saved their lives basically by arresting Jane at that point this is so nice <laughs> in custody she confesses to 31 murders however old colleagues and people like that they reckon it's a lot more like over a hundred but there's no proof of that she confesses to 31 lots of um the families of people that they suspected that jane had uh, murdered they didn't want the bodies exhumed and things like that so there was never like a true picture a true number of how many victims she actually did have she was one to talk so she said quote that is my ambition to have killed more people helpless people than any man or woman who has ever lived jane so they were like oh, she's insane and they declared her insane so she spent the rest of her life in an insane asylum at the beginning of all this when she was a student it all came out that when she was a student she would experiment on people in the hospital so she would use like morphine and other drugs and experiment like with them and see what sort of happened to them and stuff she'd spend a lot of time in their rooms like making fake charts and things like that and experimenting with these drugs on these poor people and she would like get into bed with them so there was a lot of talk about this because it's really unusual for a female serial killer to have a sexual motive behind the murders it's normally not and in this case it seems like it, it it was because she claimed that she got sexual gratification from murdering these people that she would lay beside them and hold them and often she'd hold them when they were when they died and there's no evidence and she didn't say about anything sexual happening with the victims or herself but she did say that she derived pleasure from these murders. It was floating her boat, so to speak. She was popped in the Taunton, Taunton? Taunton State Asylum in Massachusetts. And she was a handful there, it sounds. She was known to call the orderlies in and say, like, got any morphine? Let's go in there. I'll go and have some fun with the people on the ward. <sighs> they must have had to watch her carefully, that one. So she lived out the rest of her days there and she lived until she was 84. That's quite old in those days, I, I think. So yeah, 84 and she died peacefully, apparently in, um, in the insane asylum. Jane is said to have been a inspiration for a character in a novel the bad seed it's about right that novel was then turned into a play and a film and then she was also inspiration like direct inspiration for an independent film called the american nightmare or american nightmare not the the take the the off american nightmare directed by John Keyes and also a few other plays. Not much to learn from this one because what can you do? She was terrible. Super sad for the um, victims, many victims. We will never know how many victims, who, who can tell. They reckon, I saw it written down somewhere like between 70 or, and 100, but they don't really know. So lots of people, lots of people that she uh, poisoned. And their families, it's really sad for their families as well. And the shame of n that they felt to not be able to have their, the bodies exhumed, that's a bit sad, isn't it? So they never really knew what happened to their loved one. They, they, they decided not to go down that road and find out. But Yes, today's gin, I got my delivery. I was so excited and I'm so glad 
that it is delicious because it is. Let me share the joy, first of all, of this bottle. So it's a lovely bottle. I'm really enjoying it. The aesthetics. Orient. So Eastern spices and fresh citrus. Oh, gin, orient. I can't pronounce that. PNR and sun. So sorry. But it's delicious. It's absolutely gorge. Really, really nice. And today I went fancy to go with beautiful gin. Beautiful mixer. So this is two keys lemon mixer. Absolutely amazingly gorge. Really, really nice. A sparkling mixer made with real lemon juice. So that was pleasant. And then this little butte, which brings it all together, is Savannah Spritz. It's a cocktail syrup and what's in it? Basically water, sugar, concentrated peach juice, concentrated lemon juice, divine. Here we are. Gorgeous. So nice. Recommend, especially when you have small people off school. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me again this week. I hope you can join me next week for another true crime story and a glass of gin. Bye!